that's Rocky Forest reporting. But here's some noise. There's a big crowd around Jesus, listening to what he has to say, closely packed around him, they're talking, etc. Over here, there's a posse on its way from Nazareth, coming to get him, coming to do an intervention, because people are saying he's out of his mind. So they're kind of trying to try to rescue him from himself, but you'll have to wait and see what happens. Not quite sure what's going to go, but the posse is on its way, we hear that. So, see you in worship. morning. I invite you all to join us in our call to worship. It will be printed up on the screen as well as in the bulletin. And I invite you to follow along with the bold print. The Lord be with you. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is God that made us, and we are His. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. For the Lord is good. Let's join together in singing at the dawning of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Almighty God, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts for all the ways that you have blessed us, for the family that we have, for the friends that we have, for the places that we live, for the beautiful world that you have created. God, you are a good God who walks with us, who provides for us, who protects us. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our prayer of confession is printed in the bulletin. It will also be up on the screen. I invite you to follow along with us. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. And to those who believe in him, in Jesus Christ, God has given the right to be called children of God. Let's believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven, we are made to be in God's family, and given new life in him. Amen. So I want to thank you all who sent in names of people, of women, who have nurtured us, mothers biologically, by adoption, by spiritual mothers, that list of names. And we're going to run that list of names of women who have nurtured us and shaped us, and then I will pray. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the women whose names we saw and other names that we would add. For the women who have nurtured us, shaped us. For the women who have guided us in following you. We thank you for them. For the gifts that they were to us. We thank you for their commitment, for their service. We also pray that you would support and encourage the women in our lives as they face difficulties and challenges 
Strengthen them, we pray. And we thank you on this day for those who have been mothers spiritually, biologically, by adoption, by nurturing. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for your mercy never fails me. Yeah, all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am made. I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down and surrender now and I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrender now and I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I surrender now and I give you everything your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life lay down, I surrender now and I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. All my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. So anyways, I do have a story about Deborah, who shows up in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. So Deborah was the leader of the people of Israel at the time that she was what was called a judge. So think leader, don't think judge in court, but leader. And so she was the leader, 
help people figure out how to get ahead, how to live their lives, how to get along with one another. She led the people. And God sent her a message. The message was this, because, you see, the Midianites were in the land and controlling it, the people of Israel were having a hard time. And so God said to Deborah, go contact Barak, because I got words for Barak. So Deborah sent, and Barak came, and Deborah said to Barak, God has told me that you are supposed to drive the Midianites out of Israel. Now, the Bible doesn't quite say it this way, but this is basically what Barak said. He basically said, I'm a wimp. I won't do that. Now, that's a paraphrase. And Deborah said, God will be with you. You'll be fine. And Barak said, no, I won't go to do this unless you come along with me. So now she's the leader and called a prophet. And now she's going to become the general of the army. So they went to war to drive the Midianites out. Now, Deborah was a brilliant, brilliant strategist. See, the Midianite army was very fast because it had chariots. And that's what made it so scary. And the Israelites' army had no chariots. But Deborah took her army and put it on the top of a mountain. Because then the Midianite chariots would have to go uphill to get to them. And chariots going uphill don't go fast. So then the army, Israelite army coming down the mountain, was in fact able to defeat the Midianite army and they ran. And so Deborah is leader, prophet, and general. God used her. God used her. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the people in our lives that you use for your good, particularly the women in our lives, the women who lead, who guide. We say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Before we read God's word, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of your word, which we are about to partake in now. Please, O Lord, open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear, our hearts that we might perceive and carry out and understand what you are saying to us in this message today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are reading from Mark 3, 20 to 21, to start with. And the crowd came together again, so they, they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And now, continuing in Mark 3, 31 to 35. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. So it's Mother's Day, but the church, a number of years ago, switched that to call it Christian Family Sunday, to recognize that Mother's Day was a limiting way of speaking about this day, 
But even we could hear Christian Family Sunday as a limiting way or in a larger way. Because we could think about Christian family and hear that as being speaking about the nuclear family that was Christian and the celebration of just that. Or, and I think this is the way it's supposed to be heard, Christian family as being all those who follow Jesus around the world, whatever their ethnicity, background. So we are part of the Christian family, which at this point in the world is, about, is over 2 billion people. That's a big number of people to take to Mother's Day brunch. Two billion people plus. But that's the idea here, this broader sense. And we'll come back to that. But to our text. By the time we get to Mark chapter 3, Jesus is a superstar. He cannot go anywhere without drawing a crowd. And he's returned to what has become his base of operations, Capernaum. And not unexpectedly, the place is packed. So busy is he that he doesn't even have time to eat, he and and the disciples around him. No chance to sit down. He's run off his feet. And this news about the kind of life he is living, the kind of pressure he is under, trickles back to Nazareth to his mother and his brothers. And so travels from Capernaum, they get back there, and what the news gets back there, and they hear, as the line says from the text we read, he is going out of his mind. In other words, he's going crazy. And so his mother and brothers decide to mount an intervention, decide that they are going to intervene and save him from himself. And so they head off from Nazareth, a posse to come and get him and save him. Now, Mark is a good writer in telling us this story, and he knows that the disciples, that Mary and the brothers need time to get from Nazareth to Capernaum, and so he tells a story in the middle. Now, we didn't read that because if we had, we'd get lost in the details of it, but you need to know this gist about what happens from verses 22 to verse 30. So while the posse is coming from Nazareth, a group of leaders from Jerusalem have arrived, the scribes, in Capernaum to check out what Jesus is doing because they've heard the news about him and they want to check out what he's doing. And they come up with a conclusion. They say he's possessed. So you've got family on the one side who say he's out of his mind, and you've got the religious leadership who say he is possessed. You don't need enemies with people like that around you. And so there, that's the background to which the next piece happens. But we haven't given them enough time to get to Capernaum yet, and so I'm going off on a tangent to spend a little more time while they get to Capernaum. Christian Family Sunday, Mother's Day. It is an opportunity to celebrate mothers in our lives, and we have done that, and that's important. But today is not an easy day for everyone. For those who wish they were mothers and are not, this is a day of deep pressure, of deep reminding that they are not mothers and they wish they were. It's also a difficult day for those for whom their relationship with their mother was difficult, charged, hard. This is also a day that's difficult for them. And it is a reminder on Mother's Day as families gather together to celebrate that we live in a world where many are alone. And this is a day for those for whom they are alone. This is a difficult moment. And so Christian Family Sunday helps us to think broader, wider. And as we look at the next text, I think we will try to see that the Christian family is larger and breaks across those lines for whom this day may be difficult. So, the posse has arrived. Mary and the brothers have arrived. They're coming to get Jesus. But... They can't get into the house where he is because the crowd is packed into that house and there's no way in. 
And so they send a message in to say, Oh, Jesus, we're out here waiting for you. Now, you get the irony here? They think they're the insiders, Mary and the brothers. Mary and the brothers think they're the insiders, but they're outside. And those who are not related to him, those who are listening to his every word, who are following him but are not his family, who are the outsiders, are really inside. So the outsiders are insiders, and the insiders are outsiders. It's one of those interesting paradoxes that Mark confronts us with. So anyways, the message comes in, We're out here, come on out to talk to us so we can do our intervention. And Jesus says this, who are my mother and my brothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? Now let's just pause for a moment. You're Mary out there. And you get this message. He just said, who's my mother? Who does he think he is? Really? Really? But doesn't that sound a whole lot like when Jesus was 12 and went to the temple with his family and got lost for three days and they finally found him and Mary starts to tell him off and Jesus says, didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? Isn't that also saying to his mother, you're not number one? Yeah, I don't think she was happy when she heard, who is my mother? Now, she may have internalized it because this is Mary, you know. But the brothers? If my brother suddenly said to someone else, so who's that guy? Who is that says my, he's my brother? I wouldn't be quiet about my response. I'd be a little vocal. And I'm sure they were too. But Jesus just declares a new kind of family, right? He's just kissed off one of them. And then he turns and says, whoever, hears the will, whoever does the will of God, they are my mother and brother and sister. He's just declared there is a new kind of family, a new kind of reality. See, there is no perfect family in the Bible. You can't find one. They don't exist. Let's start at the beginning. The first family, Cain kills Abel. One brother kills another brother. I think that's called dysfunction. And we keep on going. Jacob's family is complete chaos. David has a son who wants to overthrow him and kill him. Hosea and Gomer have a chaotic life and name one of their children not loved. Can you imagine going around in the world with a name that says not loved? And those are just the superstars of the dysfunction. Again and again and again, the Bible tells us the stories of families that are not perfect. Why? Because families are made up of human beings. And you put human beings together, and it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. And so we need to take the pressure off ourselves. We're not building the perfect family. That's not the goal. We find our family, our belonging, our true place of being, in the Christian family, in the family that Jesus is building and creating. For in the Christian family, everyone finds a home, a place of belonging. To quote the line from Cheers, they're always glad you came. Everyone knows your name, and they're always glad you came. The Christian family is a place of belonging for those who don't fit anywhere else, for those who have no other place of belonging. The Christian family becomes the new reality, drawn together, as Jesus says, by those who do the will of God. That becomes the center, that truth. 
A number of years ago, my parents, who had been missionaries in Turkey, were flying back home here to Canada, and they had to change planes in Frankfurt. So they're in the transit lounge in Frankfurt Airport, and my mother is an extrovert. And she also has this radar sense to recognize anyone who's reading a Bible anywhere. She just has this radar sense. And so they're in the transit lounge in Frankfurt, and she looks across the transit lounge and sees a young couple with two children, and she says to Dad, I'm sure that's a Bible they're reading. We've got to go talk to them. So up they get to go across the transit lounge. It turns out that the young couple with the children are from Russia, and they speak no English. My parents speak no Russian. They do have a word in common, though, Jesus. They are part of the same family, made one in Jesus Christ. This sense that a new family is being created, a new family is being created by Jesus Christ, is one that comes through again and again in the New Testament. You may have noticed in the book of Acts, there's long conversations about about support for the widows. Widows in the first century had no supports. They were supposed to be supported by their families, by their children, but frequently the children did not do that, and, wi- and widows were alert, largely abandoned, had no source of income. But the early church, taking seriously what Jesus had said about there being a new family, those who do the will of God are part of this new family, crossing all the lines that we might use to create family, recognized the widows who joined the church as part of the family and supported them and cared for them, In fact, this care for the widow and the orphan is so large and dominant in the New Testament that you can, in fact, write it as a theme that hangs the whole book together, the whole of the New Testament together. And James says it very clearly when he says, pure religion is to do the will of God and to care for widows and orphans. This piece of building a new family for those who have no family, to build this piece is central to what the Christian church understood itself to be about. And so it drew people and lived this pattern. Because Jesus says, those who are part of this new family, they are the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven, the will of God. But what is that will? Can I have the slide, please? So what does it mean to do God's will, to be part of this Jesus family? Three characteristics that we can glean from the first two and a half chapters of the book of Mark. First, it is to repent, to tell the truth, to tell the truth about ourselves, about the families we are part of, the culture that we are in, to tell the truth. Because in the Christian family, We can put the truth on the table. We can own who we are, the wrong we have done. We can admit to it because we believe the good news that forgiveness is real. If we're afraid that we will never be forgiven, if we're afraid there is no freedom from the wrong we have done, then we're not likely to admit it. And by human nature, we duck and weave and try to avoid telling the truth about ourselves to other people. But the good news promises us forgiveness. And so we can tell the truth about who we are and what we have done and about the larger pieces that we are part of. But that good news is not just forgiveness. That good news points ahead to a deeper reality, to the kingdom that Christ is bringing. A kingdom where the violence and anger and hate that are part of our world are no more where the greed that dominates our culture is no more, where the influences of individualism and materialism, which tear apart the soul, our souls and the soul of our communities, is transformed by what God is doing in bringing the kingdom of God. And so the good news is not just that we are forgiven, but that this new kingdom is coming, that God is bringing a new way of being, 
where all the alienation that exists in our world and the divisions that exist between human beings are torn down. And we are invited to follow Jesus into that new kingdom, into that new pattern that he is bringing. And so we live by his pattern in this world, even though that is radically out of step with the world around us. And so the characteristics of the Jesus family are that we repent, we believe the good news, and we follow Jesus in the kingdom that he is building. And if we do those things, we're back to where we started our text with in Mark chapter 3, 20 and 21, they're going to think we're crazy. If they thought Jesus was crazy for living this pattern and living this way, they're going to think we are too. Because this is not the way the world works. This is not the patterns of this world. When Debbie and I went to Taiwan in 2017 as the moderator's trip, we learned about, Debbie already knew about her, but I learned about Chi Wong. Chi Wong was a gifted, skillful, indigenous woman in Taiwan who, through no fault of her own, was left abandoned after her husband abandoned her, stole all their money, and destroyed her business. She was left with nothing. She was found sleeping in the back row of a church because it was the only place she could find to be. The pastor befriended her, and Chi Wong came to faith in Jesus Christ. Chi Wong became a powerful voice, speaking to indigenous people about the love of God. And what has been called Pentecost in the hills swept through the eastern part of Taiwan through the mountains and thousands of people came to faith because of Chi Wong's preaching. When Chi Wong was asked what it was about the gospel that called her most profoundly, she said this. The Japanese who invaded this land and held us captive treated us like less than human beings. Jesus invited me into his family, seeing me as a human being. Chi Wong found a family, a place of belonging. There are tribes, indigenous tribes in Taiwan where 90% of the people are Christians because they too have found a family while everyone around them said they were lesser. They have found a family. Jesus invites us, regardless of the background we have, regardless of the brokenness of our lives, regardless of whatever it is about us, our loneliness, our alienation, all of that is set aside for we are invited into his family. We have a place of belonging. Amen. Let's join together in singing, We Are God's People.
Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you that in your Son, Jesus Christ, you are creating a new family, one that is beyond the nuclear family, beyond ethnicity, beyond genetics, beyond all of those things, a family of those who follow your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that in that place, there is a place of belonging for all of us. We rejoice in the patterns of this new family. For we repent of the things that we have done wrong and for the ways that we have not lived up to your calling. We rejoice in the good news of our forgiveness and the kingdom that you are bringing. Challenge us, urge us, prod us, we pray, that we might live into the pattern of Jesus Christ that we would be known as his, living his way. We come praying for a world that is broken, hurting beyond imagining. We remember those impacted by the cyclone hitting Myanmar and Bangladesh. And particularly we pray for those refugees who live in makeshift housing who are particularly at risk. We pray about the fires in Alberta and pray that you would send cooler weather and rain, strengthen the firefighters, be with those who have been evacuated, give them calm, we pray. We pray about the situation in Sudan and pray that you would end the violence there so that children would not be at risk. And we pray that you would end the violence in Ukraine that a way could be found and give us the courage to continue to pray for that, we pray. Remember those who are sick. Remember those who grieve. In particular, we think of the family of Helen Crane. We also pray for those for whom today is a difficult day. Let them know your love and care, your invitation into your family. And we come rejoicing with those who rejoice. In this silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. Pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There's some announcements to bring to your attention. We extend a warm welcome to all who worship with us. It's good to celebrate God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to say thank you to everyone who came to the home show to help at the booth. I think it went very well, and so thank you for being present at that. And you will see a number of announcements about our summer program. Um, so, the, so if you're willing to volunteer at um, the, two, the two summer camps, that, the, the green sheet's there for that. As well, I want to note that on June the 4th, we go to one service at 10 a.m., and we'll stay at one service at 10 a.m. until the Sunday right before Labor Day. So June, July, August, and the first Sunday of September, one service at 10 a.m. And it so happens that June the 4th will also be country gospel. And there's an additional announcement in the bulletin that I am not announcing. That's a joke. 
Let's give to God who has been so gracious and generous to us. Our tithes and offerings will now be received. cabin will do till I get home. My mansion's wander on the hills of glory. Oh, I hope my mansion sits near God's throne. Just build my mansion next door to Jesus. Us and tell the angels I'm coming home. It doesn't matter who lives around me, just so my mansion sits near God's throne. mansion might be close by me just across the golden avenue she was the first one to teach me of heaven and the very first one Lord to tell me about Let us pray. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you. Use them that all the world might know that they are invited into your family. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together in singing, Blessed be the tie that binds.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit is now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.